Good morning, church family. How are we doing today? We good? I feel like I'm freezing to the bones this morning. It's one of those freezing gusts of 20 mile an hour winds that is rough and no snow. It's like two hours north, six, eight inches of snow I'm seeing, but um, as the Lord would have it, he wouldn't have any in Augusta, Georgia. Um, so as a guy who graduated college in Colorado, I was hoping, hoping for a little bit of snow on the ground uh, this morning. I told everybody if we have snow on the ground, we're probably canceling the service and we're all meeting out there and I'm going to sled around. So just know next weekend, if that goes down, just come like with a wet waterproof clothing on because we're going to get after it in this big field that God has given us uh, to sled around on. And so it's good to be with you today. Um, I know many of you are tuning in online. Um, COVID is still COVID and we have many down and sick and exposed and unable to be in our presence today. Uh, we have many that we're going to try to travel over. I think a, a car actually went into the canal this morning. Um, so pray for that going on in that family. And I think the roads were blocked on I-20. And so a lot of different things shaping and molding and not allowing certain people to be in the room and to worship with us. But I'm, I'm grateful for technology. Uh, we've been praying for technology. The internet in here has been bad. And so know if you're tuning in online, if we get kind of interruptions along the way, um, just know we are working on the internet at Warren Belvedere. And hopefully in the next couple, couple weeks, uh, we'll get a lot of those problems solved along the way. And so uh, if you were in worship with us last week, what text were we preaching and talking about? Okay, Acts chapter 2. What happened in Acts chapter 2? What's it called? Pentecost. What happened at Pentecost? Okay, the Holy Spirit comes. And what I, I preached to you, what we talked about last week, is when the Spirit of the Lord shows up, four different things happen. Number one is that unexplainable things happen. They like tongues like fire. There was all this going on. They're speaking in languages that they had never spoken before. And so where the Spirit of the Lord shows up, unexplainable things happen. The second thing that we saw in, in Peter is that when the Spirit of the Lord shows up, that ordinary men and women receive extraordinary boldness, extraordinary uh, conviction, extraordinary power from above. And one of the things we talked about it thirdly is that when the Spirit of the Lord shows up always, every single time, is that Jesus is glorified. If Jesus isn't being glorified when the Spirit of the Lord shows up, it's not the Spirit of the Lord. And then finally, in, in a point that I wasn't able to put on the screen because I got going and I realized after my second point we were 30 minutes in and we needed to get going, so I put it in overdrive. As many preachers know, you have to do sometimes. And um, the fourth and final point, if you were taking notes last week and I want to go back and take this, is when the Spirit of the Lord Lord shows up, lives are changed. And what we saw is that 3,000 lives were changed in the book of Acts when the Spirit of the Lord showed up. And the reason I preached that message was to kind of be a launching pad for us at Warren Belvedere to really walk through for the coming next five weeks a series that's really based on our core values as a church. It's a Warren acrostic that we're going to be talking about. And in Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47 is where we're going to kind of begin with each week. And that's going to be a launching pad to a lot of different scriptures we're going to go to to really illuminate and bring to light for us who is the church, what is the church about, and what are our practices really supposed to look like. Because what began 2,000 years ago at Pentecost is the reason you're in the room worshiping today. And a lot of the same things that happened there are the same things we're doing because it was a movement that began and the early church was birthed and the kingdom of God has expanded and grown, and we're in the room because of what happened here in these verses. And so if you have a Bible with you today, I want to invite you again to Acts chapter 2, and I want to start in verse 41 just to give context, and then we're going to dive into verse 42 through 47, and we'll be preaching this over the next five weeks. Are we there? If you don't have a Bible, I want to invite you to grab one of the pew Bibles, take it home with you. It's a gift from us to you. Take it, read it. It will change your life in a way you would have never imagined when you read this thing. And so in verse 41, it says, so those who received the word, so this after Peter preached, so those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So an extraordinary movement of salvation in many, many, many souls. And then we get down one more verse in verse 42, and let's lean into this. This is what he has for us today. And it says, and they, that's all the believers, that's the early church. He says, they devoted themselves, and we're gonna have four things here, to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and of the prayers. 
and awe, or that's glory or fear, came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, let me say that again, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so from the outset, we have this tagline at Warren where we say, Warren, a way of life. What I want you to realize is that isn't like a country club. This is the way of life of Warren. What we're getting after there and what our pastor brought to us probably about 12 years ago when he first came to Warren was this idea that we are a body, we are a church, we are a people who want to live like this early church in order that our lives wouldn't just be a Sunday, Wednesday sort of thing, but because of the power of the gospel, because of the power of God's spirit in us and among us, what we do when we come here affects the way that we live every other day in every other moment of our lives. And so if I was to say this like Warren, comma, a Christ-centered way of life, a, a spirit-empowered way of life. And so we're gonna zero in just on about six little words that begin verse 42 today. And then what I said, we're going to break down over the coming weeks. And it says, they devoted themselves. Devotion. So here's what I want you to understand. This word devoted is actually like a present active ongoing tense word. So it's not a, I devoted myself once. It's not a past tense. But it, the way that it really should read is can they continually devoted themselves to. And so it's the idea of being actively engaged in what's going on. This is not a sitting on the sideline sort of Christianity that's just watching everyone else kind of play on the field that they're in. No, this is a rolling up our sleeves and bootstraps and getting engaged in what God is doing in the church. I don't know if you've ever passively driven your vehicle. I hope not. But if you're anything like me, um, I have this tendency sometimes when I kind of get off work to kind of check out a little bit. And I don't mean check out in order that I'm not driving and watching what's going on. I'm not closing my eyes saying, Jesus, take the wheel. Nothing like that. But I do have a tendency, and when I worked at the Augusta campus, that I would get in my truck some days, and I just would not, not thinking, just trying to like check out, just trying to like get my mind right before I would get home and have to be hubby and daddy. And a lot of times I would get in my truck and I did this multiple different days where I would drive my vehicle and I would take a right on Washington Road and then a right down Old Evans Road, then a left on a certain cul-de-sac and then I would turn and I would drive in the driveway and I would literally put it in park and I'd get all the way there and realize I was at my old house, not my new house. <laughs> and it's happened probably five times. I know I'm ashamed to say that, but it's just like passively just going through the motions and just doing something I'd always done. This week, I'm ashamed to say this, um, but I, I preach out of my weakness, not my strength a lot of times. But I was in the kitchen at our new house here in Edgefield, and I was talking to Sarah, or kind of talking to Sarah. She was talking to me. And I was pulling one of those. I was over at the cabinet, and I was doing something. I don't know if I had my phone or computer or something. And she's talking, and I'm going, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. And she goes, Stephen, are you listening to me? And I said, yeah. What did you just say? <laughs> right? It's just one of those moments of just being passive and not like engaged. And so what he's getting after here with this devoted word is not passively watching, but actively engaged in what God was doing in their midst. And so they're going to continually devote. They're going to be active. They're going to be big time players in what God's about to do. And they're going to devote themselves to four primary things. He says, the apostles teaching to the prayers. He says, to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread. So I just want to zero in this message on just one of those four, which he said the apostles' teaching. What would it, that would have been in that time period, would have been the entire Old Testament that would, they would have had from the prophets to the Pentateuch, all of that, and then what's being written in, in live form with them that's being taught by the apostles that we eventually have penned in the entire council of God. And so our term that I want you to get today 
Our, our core value at Warren is worship through the word. Y'all say that back to me. Worship through the word. All right, I need you to say it like you're actually preaching and not monotone like checked out, okay? Y'all ready? One, two, three. Worship through the word. There we go, that kind of passion. And so worship through the word. What I want you to understand is that we're going to walk through these six core values in everything we do as a church, every event that we plan, every worship, worship gathering that we're putting the pieces together, everything that we do at Warren fits within these six buckets that we're going to find ourselves. And I'm excited because you may be wondering, hey, I said this series is going to be five weeks and there's six core doctrines. And if you're an A personality like me, you need me to explain that really quick. And so just know we're going to walk through four weeks straight. And then on week five is going to be February 13th, which is going to be a packed Sunday, not just with bodies, but with a lot going on. It's going to be a mission Sunday. We're one of my best friends in the entire world, a missionary um, that's been in Eswatini for the last, I think, six, seven years and is now stateside. His name is Stephen Sprague. He's going to be here in the pulpit preaching to you about how we effectively engage people and we do that to the glory of God to the nations. And so we're going to have a, a mission Sunday where we celebrate all that God is doing in the world through many of our missionaries. And so you'll want to be a part of that morning. We're going to have the Lord's Supper. So I just want to go ahead and let you know that so that you can prepare your hearts to take the Lord's Supper that day. And then we do have a joy luncheon after worship that day for our widow and widowers. And so if you've not heard about that yet, um, please know our deacons will be reaching out. If you're a widow, widower or widow, um, please engage with us. We want you to come to that lunch um, and we would just love to be able to serve you in particular that Sunday after church. And so today, worship through the word. Here's what I want you to know from the outset. I want to zero in on worship, and then I want to talk at the end about God's Word. And so we were made to worship. There's going to be three points that I have for you today. Number one is this, that you and I, when we were created in the image of God, in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, when, when He breathed you into existence and, and gave you life in your lungs, and you came mother, out of your mother's womb for the very first time, and you breathed air in your lungs, you were created, designed, and fashioned with the sole purpose of worshiping. So the, the question is not, are we worshipers? The question is, what do we worship? And so A.W. Tozer, he would say it this way as a speaking to worship. He says, I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God that any man or woman on this earth who is bored or turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. And so what I think this point should make us do is a heart searching, maybe a heart surgery, a self-inventory per se, of what is our tendency to worship in our lives. You know, all throughout the Bible, anytime there was any kind of household gods, like little things that were made images that they would give themselves to, like Baal is one of those. We, we would, in modern day, maybe like Buddha, you know, little, little chubby guy that they would have in, in their house. And he, he would look at that and he'd go, you shouldn't have that. You shouldn't worship any created thing, but only the creator. And so he would purge them. Anytime they'd take over a people, they would purge the, the, the takeover of any of the household gods and they would burn them up because they wanted to worship only the one and true God. But over and over and over again, they found themselves trying to cling to something they could put their hands on, something they could touch and feel and see instead of worshiping the, the image of the invisible God. And so you and I would look at a little Buddha on a shelf and think that's absolutely absurd and ridiculous that somebody would worship that and pray to that, wouldn't we? But in reality, there are many little Buddhas in our hearts that keep us from authentically and in true worship unto the king and the one that deserves our worship. And so as I say that, I hope that God's spirit will bring some conviction upon your hearts and reveal some things to you in this moment of what do you tend to put on the altar of your heart over your true and authentic worship before God. You know, from the time we're born, we are selfish, first of all. And so we come out and they say, all oh, cute little baby. Well, guess what? The first time they cry is because they're not getting something that they desire. And so in selfishness, um, they want 
milk or they want food. And so they cry until they get what they want, right? And so just know from the outset, we are born with a tendency to worship first self. And so this is a mirror. You see it, right? Can y'all see that? Am I blinding any of you? Look at that. Ooh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. So yeah, you online, there we go. Boom, getting you in the mirror, getting you in the shot too. So our tendency, our tendency is to worship self. And, and the way that I would put this is, number one, we want to worship our comfort, and then we want to worship our success. And so where we, and the way that you can find out what you really worship is by asking a couple different questions. It's first, where do you find your greatest joy, your greatest pleasure, and your greatest happiness? Let me say that again. Where do you find your greatest joy, your greatest pleasure, and your greatest happiness? Is it when you're not sick and everything's just going well with you? You look good, you feel good, the kids are good, the wife is good. Comfort can be a, a God that keeps us from the power and the presence of God. Is it success? Is it if you could just get the right position, if you could just get the right income, the right salary, if, you, if that thing would just happen, then and only then would I be satisfied, find joy, find contentment, and find happiness. Well, if you live life long enough, you realize you get the job, you get the income, you get whatever it is, and it's empty and it doesn't give you what it promises. So we have a tendency to first point at ourselves, but then we have a tendency, then we have a tendency to turn it and worship and find our satisfaction and our joy in other people. Many of us do this to our spouse, right? We have a deep longing to want satisfaction, joy, and happiness from a friend or from a parent or from a spouse. And so what we do is we point our affections and our attention and our worship to our spouse. But let me tell you what happens there is that we place on our spouse a pressure that was never meant to be given to them because they can't live up to what God was intended to be to you. And so many of us yearn for conversation or emotional connection or physical intimacy. And over and over and over again, while we try to find our ultimate joy, fulfillment, and satisfaction from whoever that is we're pointing our worship to, over and over and over again, we're left hanging because they were never meant to give you your full and ultimate and eternal joy and fulfillment and happiness. What we were made to do is reflect the glory of the Savior back to him. You will never find horizontally joy, happiness, and fulfillment in any relationship, any position, any success, and any comfort. They all promise things they can't deliver. The only place that our worship will find its true joy, happiness, and contentment is when it's pointed vertically to the king. Amen. This is the way that C.S. Lewis would put it. He said, we are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what it meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are too easily pleased. And so our worship is first, should be pointed vertically to who God is and what he has done. So I wanna clarify a few things and then I wanna to get to the how we worship, not just who and what we worship, but how we worship and how this even works itself out in Nick and I and the way that we plan a worship set and a preaching and all these things. I wanna give some, like, some real solid roots to what we're talking about here. But before we get there, two things you need to know about how we don't worship, okay? Number one is we don't worship to just evoke emotionalism. Let me say that again. We don't just plan a worship set to evoke emotionalism. And I want to be very careful here because our goal isn't that just emotions would be evoked, but our worship absolutely includes our emotions. I mean, you can't read Psalm 51 where David is coming before the Lord in absolute like brokenness and confession of his sin and worship of God. 
and he says, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. There's a sorrow, there's a crying, there's a pouring out of emotions in worship before King Jesus. But then you get David dancing naked before the Lord as well. And that sort of happiness and crazy, we would never consider that a place this to be a place where you do anything like that. But you do read things like Psalm 150, where it says, with the clanging of cymbals, we praise the Lord. And so there's a lot of different praise and emotion and sorrow and joy that, that follows our hearts and connects with our hearts as we worship Jesus. But we never plan a worship service and worship songs and how they go together just to evoke an emotion in your hearts and in your lives that isn't true and authentic and centered upon the king. But then second, so we don't, we don't base our worship on emotionalism, but we also don't base our worship on our traditions. We don't base our worship on our traditions. If you'll flip with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15, Jesus is gonna get after the Pharisees. He always gets after the church people. It's rarely the sinful people that he's upset with. And I just wanna read you these nine verses. I'll give you a chance to get there. He says, then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and they said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And he answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you said, if anyone tells us father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he, heed not, he need not honor his father. For, so for the sake of your tradition, get this, get this. For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy among you, when he said, the people, they honor me. This is a tendency for us. They honor me with our lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doc doctrines the commandments of men. What he's saying is that we don't just plan our services, and we don't just plan our songs, and we don't just plan our, our preaching based on what we've always done. We base what we're doing on what God has told us to do, on who he is and what he has done. So we don't worship to create emotion, and we don't worship based on our tradition, though we can have rich tradition that guides and leads what we do. So how do we worship? Let's get the right way to do this, okay? And I'm going to go backwards in this, because often in Scripture it says that we worship in, what's it say right after that? in spirit and in truth. Okay, so those are the two points today, but we're doing them backwards. So we worship in truth and we worship in spirit. So if you're taking notes today, that's my three points. We were made to worship. And how do we worship? We worship in, in truth and we worship in spirit. And so how do we worship? We worship in truth. We worship through the word. That's what our, our, our core value, our doctrine is, is we worship through the word word. Let me just say this. Worship doesn't end when Nick gets off the stage and preaching begin when I get on the stage. Everything that happens on the stage is an act of worship unto the Lord. Whether that's songs that we're singing, scriptures that we're reading, or scriptures that I'm preaching. From beginning to end, everything we're doing up here along with you with us is an act of worship unto God. And so that's why our pastor has written this statement about worship through the word. Worship is the first activity of our church, and it affects everything that we do. We believe that all true worship is dependent on the knowledge of God. The Bible is the perfect revelation of God, who he is, what he's done, and why he alone is worthy of our worship and praise. We don't worship the God of our imagination, but God revealed in time, history, revelation through the scriptures, worship begins and ends with the word of God reflected in music, prayer, and teaching. We gather to confess and celebrate that God is worthy and we depart to live for his glory. Can I just tell you one of the greatest signs of a true conversion to believe in Jesus for me? 
So as a pastor, when I, when I meet up with people and they tell me I've given my life to Christ, one of the first questions that I ask them is, do they have a hunger or a desire to read God's word? Because what I believe God's spirit does when he frees you from your sinfulness and your brokenness, and you put your life, your trust, your faith in Jesus, what follows is an appetite and a hunger to read, eat, and understand God's revealed word in his scripture to us. And so let me say this with that, because many of you have been a believer a very long time. I've never met a powerful, strong, effective Christian that doesn't read, meditate, and love God's word. This is why Psalm, says it, Psalm 1 says it this way. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffer, but his delight, that's his love, his cherish is on the law of the Lord. That's God's word. And on it, it says, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that bears its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, comma, he prospers. You want to be effective? You want to do something with your life that matters? Root yourself in God's word. Read it, eat it, love it, and allow it to come and to change and transform who you are. You see, this is what, why when we preach, most series that we do are expositional. What I mean by that, we go straight through books of the Bible. So if you're new here at Warren, just know it's coming pretty quickly. We're probably going to start a book of the Bible, I think, in May after we do a, a small mini-series around, around Easter that's about five weeks called Here for This. When we get done with that, we're going straight back to a book because what we believe about God's Word is it's sufficient in and of itself. We don't need to add to it. We don't have to take away from it. It is the effective tool and work of God. It is the very voice of God written to men. In order that it would mold and it would shape us along the way, there's two primary scriptures that guide this for us. Hebrews chapter 4, 12, and then 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Let me read it to you. It says this, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces between the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and it discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And then 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Amen. Psalm 119, 9 would say it this way. He says, how can a man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? So what that means is like, we were actually just driving to go take our, our kiddos to watch a movie at the movie theater. We haven't done that in like two years because it's too expensive, but we decided to use some Christmas money and take them to see Sing 2, which is an amazing kids movie. You should go see it. Great storyline and it's awesome um, just movie. But we were going across the bridge and Sarah looks at me. She goes, does that brick wall not terrify you? Like if we hit that, would we go over? And it's crazy that God would have somebody go over that into the canal today after talking about that last night. But those things that they have there that are usually permanent. What are those called? Guardrails. There we go. Somebody said it over here. A guardrail, right? So why is the guardrail there? This isn't, I mean, this is not rocket science. I mean, this is like elementary. Why is the guardrail there? To guard you from going where? Over, right? It's to keep you safe and keep you on the path and keep you on the direction that you want to go. I lived in Colorado, like I said, the last two years of college. Some of those passes that you go over when it's icy and there's like blizzard snow coming, you're very grateful when you look beside you and you can't see the lines of where you're going that you see a guardrail very quickly and you see people slide into those all the time. Because that guardrail, if it was removed, all of a sudden it opens us up to all kinds of danger on the other side. And so what he's saying in Psalm 119, verse 9, is that the man that loves God's word is one who has the guardrail up and is keeping their way straight and pure in order that it doesn't open our lives to destruction. The second you don't read, consume, love, and intake God's word, boom, it's going down and opens your life up to so much havoc. 
I want to go one other place. I know I'm taking you a lot of places today. Would you flip to Psalm 19 with me? And Nick helped me so much with this message. So a lot of these notes are his notes from some teaching he's done in former days. So I'm grateful for that, buddy. I've never called you buddy. (laughs) Psalm 19, verse 7, says it this way about God's law. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold and much, much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, like the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So what is this psalm getting after? It's getting after that God's word is really, really, really good, number one. And what God's word does, what this psalm is doing, it's not just a a commandment to obey. It's a lifestyle to live that is centered on in worship through who God is and what God has done for us. And so the first place of worship that we have and why we worship is based on the character and the nature of God. And what we need when we come into this place every single week is we need our hearts to be realigned to really know and understand and be reminded of who God is. He is our north. But then secondly, we sing not just because of who he is, we sing because of what he has done. This is Exodus chapter 15. I read this to you about, I think, three weeks ago when I was doing a welcome. Exodus 15, this is after the Lord parts the Red Sea. The the people of Israel go through it. Boom, he, he puts the waters down, kills all the Egyptians. And the only logical response in the heart of Moses is to sing the first song of all of Scripture. Did you know that? In Acts chapter, I mean, in Exodus chapter 15, that's the first song of all of Scripture. And it's a song written to praise God, not just for who he was, before his hand and what he had done in their midst. And this is why on February 20th, when you come in the room, it's going to look a little different and there's going to be some other people on the stage playing a part with me because we are going to celebrate God's hand in the 100-year history of Belvedere First Baptist Church. And we're going to have former pastors and worship leaders be a part with us. And I hope you will come ready and invite anybody that's been a part of this church in the last hundred years. It's not just spiking the football or or just honoring people, though we're doing that. This is going to be a worship service where we're rejoicing and we're praising what God has done. You know, it's sort of like a celebration chant, kind of like a winning chant along the way. Y'all know this? Does this make anybody else just want to kind of bounce around, right? I mean, this is like the Russian Ivan has just been defeated, right? Rocky with blood and sweat and tears. His hands are up, right? That's what we do when we gather as God's people. And I hope that as we play the piano and as we play the violin, which is beautiful, and we play the, the drums and we play the guitar and, and we sing these words, that it would be like that. It would evoke that type of emotion in your hearts to connect with God because he's a good God. But he's not just a good God who's far off. He's a good God that's near, that has done week to week amazing and miraculous things in our life. If you have breath in your lungs, and health to sing praises to him, that alone is a miracle of the Lord, and it deserves our worship and our adoration. All right, I gotta get it in overdrive. This is two weeks in a row of you guys just don't listen quick enough. And so, (laughs) all right, so Colossians 3, how we pick the songs that we play. This is important. I think this is important to, to, to give you counsel on and to shape for us. So in Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5, there's two scriptures we're going to read that repeat very similar things. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And then it says this, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Y'all say that with me. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs 
with thanksgiving in our hearts to God, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Okay. So these are three different, though unified, ways in which we sing praises to God. There's psalms, there's hymns, and there's spiritual songs. So our worship is not based on our preference. Let me say that to begin with. So there isn't a preference of traditional or contemporary. No, no, no. We're unified, and our our preference is God's Word. And God's Word is the thing that guides our worship. And in that, there's three types of songs that we sing. There's psalms, there's hymns, and there's spiritual songs. So psalms. Psalms are these emotive kind of truths about who God is that we just read. They're like Psalm 19. Waymaker is one of these songs where my, even my three-year-old can sing Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness. You don't want me to be your worship leader, do you? Right? <laughs> but my three-year-old will stop somebody at the movie theater and just start singing Waymaker because it's a hymn. And it's amazing how I can preach my guts out week after week after week. And you won't remember anything I say, but we sing Waymaker and you're singing that in your hearts all week long, aren't you? Because it's something about music that God has created to have the truths of God be carried with us. And so we sing songs like Waymaker, truths about who God is. But then we sing hymns. Hymns are those deep, theological, true songs. They're in your hymnal, and they were written by theologians to keep us singing the doctrines of the faith, the, the doctrines of old, that there are doctrines that are rooted in God's word that are the same truths today. This is why we would sing a song like In Christ Alone, where it gives us a clear picture of the gospel singing, In Christ Alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross Jesus died. The wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live, I live. And so we'll sing psalms, we'll sing hymns, and we'll include that in our worship. And then we will sing spiritual songs. What's a spiritual song? These are those moments where we slow down a bit and we may say one truth about God, like, a, like the, the song, Holy, where we're gonna say, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's the picture of revelation. Why would we slow down and why would we repeat a word over and over and over again? It's because we wanna give our minds time and space that our hearts would connect with our minds and our affections would match what we're singing about who he is. And it gives God's spirit the space to speak particular things and convict particular things in our hearts together along the way. And so we worship in truth. We also worship, point number three, in spirit. This is the Ephesians 5. So Ephesians 5, 17 through 20, it says a very similar thing about the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But before that is what I want you to get. He says, do not... Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. That's just a big word meaning foolishness. But what I want you to get is the next part. So don't be intoxicated, comma, but be filled. That's being filled. That's ongoing filling with God's spirit. And then comes the worship, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we're getting after here is that when we come into this place and we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, they are not just songs that we say words with our mouth, but it's all to the end of engaging with a person. If all we're doing is voicing something with our lips that never connects with our hearts and never connects with God's spirit working and moving in us, then we've missed the point of worship. You see, the point of our services is communion with God. As John 15 would say, go read it this week. I don't have time to go there and teach you this, but it's abiding in God. It's connecting with God. It's worshiping God. It's experiencing God. You see, as Isaiah, when you read Isaiah 6, 
when he comes face to face with the glory and the presence of God, which is what we're going for, and joining, like Lorenzo said, the generations who've come before us. How cool is that? When we sing, we're, we're connecting our hearts with generations upon generations who are before the throne of God singing the praises with us. And when we do that, when we come into the presence of God, this is what happens to Isaiah very quickly. Number one, he goes, whew, I am sinful. That should be our first posture. When we come into the presence and the holiness of God, it's woe is me, I'm a sinful man. And every time you see somebody come to the presence of God, boom, they're like prostrate, right? They're terrified because they're terrified that God's going to consume them in his holiness and their brokenness. But then he comes from the throne, something like an angel, and he touches Isaiah's lips, and he says, your sin is atoned for, pretty much like your sin because of Jesus now that we're post-Jesus, like we're looking back at him in the cross. He's saying, hey, all of your sinfulness and all of your brokenness that should keep you from the power and the presence of God, Jesus by his blood has made a way where you can come freely to him. And so we realize our brokenness and sinfulness. He convicts our hearts of our misaligned notions of what we have been worshiping. He shows those to us in order that we would repent and that we would believe and that he would forgive. And then what do we see in Isaiah? Who shall, whom shall I send? Who will go for me? Here I am, send me. It's a renewed purpose. So we hope every single week as you come in here, that when you come into the presence of God, that you realize your brokenness and your sinfulness You'd realize the glory of what Jesus did on a cross and what happened with the power that he resurrected from the grave, the same power that lives in you by his spirit. And in that, that you would have a renewed fervor for the mission of God in your workplaces, in your neighborhoods, and wherever you would find yourself day by day living to the glory of Jesus. And so communion is central element of our worship. As the band comes back up, I just want to end with two things. One, an illustration. Two, a quote from Nick, because it's kind of a mic drop quote that I think we need to hear today. Imagine every day you got home from work. Gentlemen, I'll just speak to you for a second, but this could be flip-flop to the lady side. And let's say every day I had written my Sarah um, a note. And every day I got to the couch. We put the kids down for bed about 7.30. We finally sit down on the couch at 8 o'clock. And every single day I do the same thing. I get out a piece of paper that I put in my pocket and I'm sitting right here. She's sitting beside me, but I don't look at her. I just get it out, I flip it open, and I say with a monotone voice, Sarah, I love you. You're a great mother. You're a great wife. I love you dearly. Flipped on the TV, go about our night. Night number two, do it again. Sarah, I love you. You're a great mother. You're a great wife. I love you. But I never look her in the eyes. I never show any affection. I never really connect with what we're doing in love with one another. I just rotely read whatever's on the page. Nick said it this way. He said, perhaps the apathetic worshiper unveils the reality that we are often far more comfortable learning about God than we are communing with him. Imagine if our church gatherings were like an unending school system where we spend our entire lives theorizing about a relationship with God without ever practicing it. So I don't know how that strikes you, but my hope is that, man, when we come in this place and we sing songs, and even in this next moment as we sing a song of response, my prayer is that you would actually engage with the living God. And if you're not, the question then beckons itself, why not? Like what is keeping you from worshiping the living God? He's singing over you, so what's keeping you from authentically singing to him? Usually when something's marred in a relationship horizontally, it's because there's been some type of breach of trust. And so for us, there's, if we're not authentically worshiping or we don't feel freedom in worship, it's probably because we're holding something in our heart that's keeping us from the power and the presence of God. And so my encouragement to you today is to repent and to turn back to God. He's faithful and he's true and he's just and he'll cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. And he's just waiting for your heart to be moldable again. And confession and repentance is the thing that takes a hard heart and it puts it malleable 
in the hands of God. And he'll mold it and shape it into something beautiful. Pray with me. Jesus, I just pray that as we worship today, that would it just be a rote going through the motions because it's what we always do. Three songs, a message, message, one song and out. God, may that never be the posture of our hearts. May the posture of our hearts be one of stillness and slowness and authentically engaging with the living God. You're here by your spirit. You promise that when your church gathers. May we never be so hard that we miss the spirit of the Lord. Father, may this next song be a song of response where many of us lay some things down, maybe some things we've been holding on to for years, that we'd put them at your feet, Lord, that we'd experience the freedom found in Christ and that your spirit would remind us of renewed purpose that you have for us, that you would speak visions and dreams in our minds and in our hearts for things you have for us in Belvedere and to the ends of the earth. Would you move now in power in our midst? In Jesus' name, amen.